Good afternoon. I'm Joe from SpringPod, your host for today's landmark lecture. Before I hand over to Sam Perret, CEO and Group Principal of London Southeast Colleges, I just want to quickly run through a couple of housekeeping points with you. Now, today's landmark lecture should last about half an hour. And at the end of today's seminar, there'll be a chance to ask questions. So please do submit your questions using the Q&A function, which is available on the screen in front of you. And don't forget, a recording of the event will be made available on the college website. Now, I'd like to hand you over to Sam Perret. Sam, over to you. Thanks very much, Joe. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, and we haven't had the pleasure of meeting in person yet this academic year, um, I'm Sam Perrette, and I'm the principal here at London South East Colleges. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on our virtual uh, landmark lecture today. Um, this lecture is part of a series um, of lectures that we run here at the college to encourage a really diverse mix of speakers to address our staff and students on a wide range of subjects. And today, I'm especially delighted to introduce our speaker, Matthew Trainer, who's the Chief Executive of the Oxley Foundation NHS Trust. And prior to his role at, at um, Oxley's, Matthew worked for King's College Hospital NHS Foundation Trust, where he was the Managing Director of the Princess Royal University Hospital uh, here in Bromley. So he's very well known to us and to the local area. Um, what you might not, not know about Matthew is that in March 2020, he took up a three month secondment to help establish and run the first NHS Nightingale Hospital here in London as part of the efforts of everyone across the NHS to pull together to deal with COVID-19. And we were really, really proud um, that as our, our local NHS chief executive, and uh, Matthew was uh, given that opportunity. And I know he's going to tell you a little bit about that today. It is clearly a very, very busy time for Matthew at the moment, given the increased transmission of COVID-19 and so we are especially grateful for Matthew's time today. And he's going to be speaking to us about leading an organisation through challenging times and sharing some of his thinking about the effective leadership strategies that he's brought into play during the last six months. And he's also going to be talking to us about some of the career opportunities available within the NHS and roles that are going to be needed in the future. Um, that, that area in particular is especially interesting to us um, as a college and I know many of our students here today are joining us because of your interest in future careers and roles uh, in the NHS but also Oxley's is an interesting partner organisation for here, us here at the college on many many other levels as well. Um, in relation to mental health, which we know is such a critical issue um, for us as students studying as a topic um, for careers, also for our staff and students in building resilience uh, um, at this very, very difficult time. And we'll also be giving an opportunity for questions um, at the end of Matthew's lecture. And I'm sure there'll be lots of questions arising in relation to COVID-19 and in particular, um, some very interesting work that um, Matthew referred to recently actually on his own social media um, around the whole socio-economic links with the current pandemic and the impact of social and economic uh, conditions as well as biological conditions on the current uh, COVID pandemic. So I'm going to hand over to Matthew now. Um, it's going to be an absolutely fascinating lecture and there will be an opportunity to, to ask lots of questions afterwards by uh, using the chat function. So thanks very much and over to you, Matthew. Thanks very much, Sam. Thanks for that lovely introduction as well. So we'll just see my slides come up here. That's the very last one that's given away the end. All right, thanks, chaps. All right, um, my name's Matthew Trainer. I am Chief Executive of Oxley's NHS Foundation Trust. We're a community and mental health trust, and we work in Bexley, Bromley, and Greenwich in South East London. And we also deliver prison healthcare in South East London, Wandsworth, and in Kent. Um, we've got around 3,700 staff, and we work in all kinds of different places, hospitals, schools, and um, lots of care we deliver in people's homes and in the community. And um, we have an annual budget of around 300 million pounds, which I'm responsible for. And um, we've got a good CQC rating. And also, as Sam mentioned earlier this year, I was deputy chief exec of the Nightingale Hospital in Excel. And we are, of course, still on standby there. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. And um, first, I thought it might be interesting just to hear a bit about my career and how I got here. 
Um, this probably isn't a very normal career path for a chief exec, and I'm not sure it's a, a recommended career path, but it might give you an idea of some of the, the diversity of backgrounds available to people who join the NHS. I mean, um, I went to a comprehensive school in Staffordshire in the West Midlands, and the um, first job I had, apart from a paper round, was um, when I was around 14, when I used to do cleaning of ovens in a bakery on Saturday morning. And as a result through that, I, I used to do quite a lot of uh, work in, in sort of school half terms and holidays as a factory worker, working on conveyor belts in factories. And then as I went off to be uh, to go to university, um, I went to Leeds and studied history and philosophy. I went to Leeds because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And they had um, a good music scene around the kind of music I was into then. I was a bit of a goth. And so that was my uh, leading choice for university. So it wasn't, wasn't the best, most structured approach, but I had a great time there and, and learned some great things actually doing history and philosophy throughout that period. Um, I did a lot of temping work. And um, when I came out of university, didn't know what I wanted to do. And um, started off as a record shop manager up in Lancaster, um, which I wasn't very good at because I loved records, but I didn't love shop management. And while there, I started writing a lot of articles for the local paper. I went in to see them and said, look, I'd like to write music reviews. And as a result, I went off and trained and became a journalist. So the highest qualification I've actually got is in journalism. Um, and I've also got a master's in philosophy, which I did when I was a bit older. So nothing clinical there. Um, I spent a bit of time in the civil service um, and worked in the voluntary sector and then came into the NHS when I was probably about 33, 34. Um, and worked in the Care Quality Commission, then at NHS England, and then, as Sam said, I worked at King's College Hospital running the Pru in Bromley before I joined Oxley's um, in October around two years ago. So um, what happened earlier this year, so I'd say I did a lot of different things there. The one thing that kind of holds all those bits of the career together was I was really interested in people and their stories and their stories about what affected their lives. And journalism was probably the thing that I most enjoyed outside of what I currently do. Um, and what I loved there was going out and speaking to people whose lives had been affected by something, affected by something random or unfair, and who wanted the newspaper to try to help them get some kind of justice or some kind of improvement in, in that unfairness. And I think that's one of the things that's really driven me to want to join the NHS, to try to redress that balance and to try to do things that do make a difference. Because, you know, I think this year has really brought our mortality home to a lot of us. And I think, you know, if you've got one go at it, you want to do something that you feel has been worthwhile over your life's journey. So although they may look like, like some quite random jobs, I spent a lot of that time listening to people who've come from a lot of different backgrounds and circumstances. And I suppose one of the things that most motivates me is, is that chance to try to do things for people who've been dealt an unfair hand in life and, and try and make things better for them. So anyway, earlier this year, um, 27th of March, I was at home. Um, I'd just done an all staff broadcast at Oxley's talking about COVID. And my phone rang at about half 12 and it was a very experienced NHS chief exec in London who rang up and said, we'd like you to come to this new hospital we're setting up in the Excel. You might have heard about it and I had read about it in the Guardian earlier that week. And I actually texted one of my mates saying, Bly, maybe you've seen what they're doing at the Excel. And um, they're looking at, you know, maybe a thousand beds for people who've got COVID and who need intensive care. And um, I had a conversation with, with this uh, colleague of mine, I told my wife and my children what was involved and packed a suitcase. Um, and the next morning I arrived at the Excel in London um, in Newham and that was going to be my sort of permanent home, staying in the hotel there, certainly for the next two months and um, with only the occasional night back with my family. And um, when I arrived, I walked into these incredible big halls at the Excel, which you can see one of them there. It's a kilometre long from one end to the other. And it was a buzz with people from the NHS, people from the military and private contractors who had been set this goal of setting up an intensive care unit to deal with what we understood was going to be a huge wave of people sick with COVID who were going to need access to ventilated intensive care. And who, if they didn't have access to that care, were likely to, to um, see quite a high rate of mortality, a high number of deaths among them. And when I arrived, it was into this kind of scene where what you've got there is a map of the hospital on the floor in tape with people from clinical, military and other backgrounds walking through every single step of what needed to be done. And I walked into a team that had only been together for a week, but had already really been through some really intense stuff, thinking about how do we as London mobilise this huge NS NHS effort to try to save lives. And we were hearing all these horrible stories from Italy and other parts of the world about what we could expect. And walking in there was just this determination, what can we do to get it right? And the scene at the, the Excel Centre, I mean, if you've ever been there for a conference, it's a huge place. Um, and what you can see there is just, that's basically one quarter of the two areas. 
And it was this immense space um, and the determination was to try to get as many beds in there to offer this ventilated care for people. And, and that was the 20th of March. And then the week that followed, I think, was probably the strangest um, of my entire life. And I don't imagine it'll get much weirder than that where there was just these incredible teams of people working day and night to build something that would be able to deal with what all the modeling at that point was trying to tell us was going to come. And what you can see is that one week later from that, um, I was walking around there with, um, that's Sir Simon Stevens, the chief executive of the NHS, a fantastic guy um, who came along to show us support. And Hugh Pym, the BBC's um, media correspondent interviewing him, and what we managed to do was effectively set up a, a proper hospital ward environment inside the Excel Center. And at that point, we had 42 beds ready to go, which you can see in that shot there with the ventilators and all the critical care equipment we would need to try to keep people with COVID alive. And really over the space of that week, there was some tremendous um, challenges to deal with, which I'll talk a bit more about in a minute. But, you know, this wasn't a field hospital. This wasn't, you know, camp beds in a tent um, or in a warehouse or something. You know, this was a ward environment where all these people from different backgrounds had just come forward and said, I want to help and we want to do something about this. And you'll probably remember what was on the news at the time and all the attention in it. And we saw over the course of that week, um, we went from this position of walking into this, you know, giant empty hall to this position where you might have seen this on the news. We were all there socially distanced standing on those taped crosses on the floor because um, at that point already, if you posted a photo on social media, we were standing too close to each other. You'd get 50 comments saying, why aren't you social distancing? And, and you know, quite right too. Um, where we were in this position where we had the Prince of Wales opening the um, Nightingale Hospital through video link from Balmoral. And I was there with, with um, the Secretary of State, um, Matt Hancock MP. And in the background there, a range of the people from across London who made this happen ranging from Dr. Alan McLennan, the, the medical director, Vin Duica, regional medical director, um, our chaplaincy team, um, you know, all the people who were there trying to help us make this a facility that we could be proud of and that would save lives and make a difference in London. And what was interesting also, though, I remember talking to my dad about all the, the sort of really positive press we'd had at that point. I said, it won't last. I said, you know, the way things like this work, the media narrative is always, you know, let's build it up and then let's start to look for the cracks and let's start to look for the things we can take the story to the next level on. And sure enough, within a couple of days, we were seeing, you know, this kind of thing. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm one of the figures hanging around out the window there in a Cold War Steve image. He's this really fantastic artist who does this tremendously um, powerful satirical stuff on, on Twitter. And, you know, in the bottom right there, you know, a Martin Rouse and Cardio, you know, a cartoon from The Guardian with this quite iconic image of us opening the hospital. People were already starting to question elements of the government's response, whether the Nightingale was a, a kind of political setup, trying to offer people some kind of panacea for other failings in the system and so on. And what was fascinating was the pace with which we went from this incredibly focused, powerful internal narrative around we've got to get these beds and we've got to get this, this healthcare provision in place. There's something where we were also starting to have to quite rapidly deal with some very questioning and probing stuff in, in the media and the outside world. Lots of the questions were very valid. Was this the right thing to do? Were we managing the response right? But some of it also, as any of you who use um, social media will know, gets into the quite abusive territory. And I suppose I'm old enough and thick skinned enough to not pay too much attention to it. But it was certainly fascinating seeing the effect on the staff. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So, so what made this first phase difficult? The pace, it was, you know, Tremendously big decisions taken by people who, despite their energy, were very tired um, and we had partial information about what was going on. And I think we all forget quite how frightening that time of the year was and quite how frightening that March-April period was. Huge changes in the modelling and what the demand for the Nightingale was going to be. You know, And even as we were setting up in that first week, we were going from being told we'll need 1,500 beds a year to actually it might be 750 to actually it's maybe 500 or so. Resources outside our control. Um, where we were trying to marshal all these ventilators and the equipment and the staff we needed, but none of them were permanently based at the Nightingale. Dealing with the communications challenges of an entirely outsourced workforce, we had very few of our own staff who were dependent on London's Trust to help us staff. And trying to deal with comms in that scenario where you've got no intranet, no email list of who works for you, etc., that you can easily access, you know, pose all these kinds of fascinating challenges. As I said, the social media stuff, I won't forget and um, seeing critical care nurses coming off a 12-hour shift and then looking at some of the comments that had been posted on Twitter and sitting down tremendously upset by some of the criticism 
that we as an organization were coming in for and you know and it's fair enough have a pop at someone like me but you really felt for some of those clinical staff who were there and um, also the interesting thing about the culture of an organization which takes years to build and yet we were in this environment where in weeks we were trying to work through all this you know and the hospital itself opened within a week of me joining within two weeks of the idea coming together and then it was only five weeks later that actually we were discharging our last patients, having only had 54 people through, not the thousands we feared might come through. And there was a bit of guilt in that as well, and I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. But that fear and the concern from friends and family across the pace of the work, that meant the sort of leadership role I was playing was tremendously challenging. Um, some personal reflections. I think I've never been that scared in my life, actually. It's the first time I walked into the ward and imagined it full of people on ventilators. It was a really um, profoundly chilling thought, because both because what it would mean for the people in there. And at that point, 50% of people coming through intensive care were dying. We've now got the survival rate up above 70%. We've made real progress, actually, this year in treating people and keeping them well. But you really thought for this to be the best place for us to care for these people, what will be happening across London's NHS and what will people be going through. But then interestingly, there was a kind of sense of anticlimax around the whole es escapade because we did this enormous piece of work to build this, this, um, this as safe as we could make it intensive care unit. And yet we weren't needed in the way we thought we'd be. And I suppose there was part of you thinking, I'd like to know if it would have worked if we'd really been needed. But to want that to happen, you would have, um, you'd have had to see a lot of people suffering to need the Nightingale. So I think a lot of us felt that sense of anticlimax and also a bit of guilt because actually we've been, you know, as, as like me, people were ringing up, sending all these messages of hope and positivity. And then there were some times where you looked around and thought, you know, 54 patients, you know, you felt a little bit as though, you know, a little bit fraudulent, to be quite honest, in terms of some of the expectations and what we delivered. But the cross side of that, do we wish it had been busy? Absolutely not. You know, it's an insurance policy. Very glad it was there. Very glad it wasn't used. But there was so much conflicting emotion going on there and I suppose some of these other points sometimes you didn't know what to do to help it was so busy so focused um, and you know the clapping you know we were out there clapping but sometimes I was really worried about whether we had enough PPE for the staff and whether we were doing as well as we could and someone said to me who was working there I've remembered I'm good at my job and I love doing it and the reflection that the Nightingale gave us a clarity of focus that they didn't have in the job at their own trust and that raised lots of questions for me about the job I do now, you know, my Oxley's job. Do, do we really create the right conditions for clinicians to do the very best they can? And what we found in that couple of months at Nightingale was because it was two or three years worth of work crammed into this incredibly short and stressful space, you had a huge amount to think about and reflect on. There was some brilliant stuff happened there. I mean, it was the real highs and lows. You know, the team was pulled together because we had this incredibly clear purpose. We wanted to save lives that would otherwise be lost because there was lack of access to care. And that clarity, that absolute clarity is very rare in the NHS, actually. And it was a brilliant motivating factor. And because of the way we had to work, we took a, a lot of leadership from the military on this. And we had lots of small expert teams of clinicians or clinicians and military who just knew what they had to do to help the whole come together. And there's a book called Team of Teams by Stanley, Stanley McChrystal, which is quite interesting on this. And a lot of the, the military guys recommend this to me. But it really explains how you set a framework and then you let the experts get on with it. And we don't do enough of that in the NHS. You know, we don't celebrate enough of the brilliant leadership that we can bring in from clinicians and that partnership working. And it's something I've tried to bring back to Oxley's. We had a relay model, and um, so I partnered up with Professor um, Charles Knight, a wonderful man who runs um, St Bartholomew's Hospital, because in the, he was the chief exec, I was the deputy, because we knew we were going to be working around the clock, but we also knew people would be going off sick. And sure enough, in that first week, um, around a third of the senior team um, were diagnosed with COVID and had to go off, so all the deputies had to stand in and run the place. One of the posts, the lead person went off, their deputy then was diagnosed with COVID and we saw it absolutely running through the workforce at that point. So we had to, to build this relay model, but it actually worked really well. And then there was some other stuff in there about how well staff responded to the support, the investment, the donations we were able to give to make their lives better, the training model and how we applied quality improvement. I won't say much about that, but you, you should Google it. It's a really good improvement methodology. We turned into a live way to develop the center. And um, we saw that non-clinical staff can make hospitals better places. And we had a lot of volunteers come forward from a huge range of non-NHS backgrounds. And with a couple of days training, they were in there in an intensive care environment, helping out on a ward, working with these patients who were intubated and sedated, so they were unconscious and on ventilators. 
and we had these teams of people who were there caring for their physical needs, you know, helping keep them clean, help them brush their teeth, keep look after them, turn them over every every 16 hours or so to make sure that their lungs got the best opportunity to bring in oxygen. And it was really incredible how people stepped forward to help like that, how we could deploy them in hospitals. And I suppose one of the great lessons I took from it is, is working with great people can make anything bearable. And there really was some brilliant people there, as there is in my own trust and as I found throughout my NHS career. Um, I it, it, you know, quite an incredible experience. I suppose it's fair to say I've got mixed emotions about it all. That was um, on my last day there. After the two months, I went in and propped my camera up on a, a trolley so I could take a selfie there. I don't take many selfies, but I wanted to remember that last day. And that was that was the ward where we had those 54 patients through, and of, of those 54, um, 20 of them died. And so that's 20 families and groups of friends who were affected uh, by this. And yet they had access to the care they needed and actually our survival rate for the ward was good and compared well with other um, ICUs in London. And I suppose when I look back at it all, I wouldn't change it for the world, um, but I think I'm still absorbing some of the lessons from it and I suspect I will for the rest of my life actually. And actually when you replicate that across the tens of thousands of, of NHS staff in London who've done, who've worked in far worse conditions than I ever had to, you know, the ICU staff, the intensive care staff who've had to work these incredible shifts I think it'll be years before we really understand the impact of it all. Um, and so what I'm gonna do is draw a bit of a line there briefly under the, the Nightingale experience and talk to you about some of my reflections on leadership off the back of that. And I hope that was um, that was helpful. So you go into these things and think about what's your role as a leader? What are you there to do? Um, and you're there to set direction. And that's what, what we try to do in the Nightingale. Tell people what we're there to try to achieve. And you do that with optimism because people look to you as a leader to set an example for them. And leaders have to be optimistic. Now, I don't mean whitewashing over terrible situations and pretending that you don't have problems. You have to be open and honest about problems, but you have to work with optimism. And also as a leader, direction, optimism, and the third thing, really important, build teams that are better at what they do than you are. And if any of you watched Killing Eve, um, really good series, there was a great quote in that from someone who said, management is watching someone else do a job more badly than you could do it. Um, you have to avoid getting into that ego position as a, as a leader. You have to build teams and trust them and allow you to do what they're really good at. And that ultimately allows you to find your right space as a leader. You know, you have to make sure the right things are happening and stop the bad things from happening. Um, you know, that's the definition of regulation. Actually, you know, it's to make good things and put a stop to them. You know, ask for help from those around you. Listen and act on what you hear and um, make decisions. I don't know if you've ever had a boss. Um, who um, has has not made decisions, but that's really frustrating, you know, so you need to listen to those people around you and act on what you've heard. Encourage the taking of risks. I've learned more in my career sometimes from things I've got wrong than from what I've got right, but I've done it with a supportive boss who's helped me in that framework to take risk. And celebrate successes of the teams around you. Take that time to note the individuals who've done well and to go to them and thank them for that contribution they've made. Um, because a great thing I heard someone say in a job interview once actually, you know, you succeed as a team, but as a leader, sometimes you fail because of what you've done as an individual or not done as an individual. So make sure you celebrate that success and don't take credit for other people's work. You know, um, make sure those people hear that you, they've been recognised and that, that recognition is really important. And something that's really come home to me through COVID, um, value the well-being of the people that you lead over their productivity. Because if you look after people well, they will do their jobs well. I do not need to tell my psychiatrists or my mental health nurses or our physiotherapists or our podiatrists, I don't need to tell them how important it is that they job, do their job well. That's what they want to do. My job is to make sure they've got the tools and the resources and the structures around them and the frameworks that allow them to excel. So value the well-being of the people you lead over their productivity. And I really try to bring all this to bear in the Nightingale, working alongside some brilliant other leaders in, in that place. And I suppose the thing to think about with leadership is it's a skill you can practice. You know, you can practice to get better at anything. And this idea that you're a charismatic born leader, I think that's a little bit rubbish. I think, you know, some people obviously have more going on there than others, but you know, you can practice this. Listen to what other people think about you. You know, find out how others see you, what they think is good and bad about the way that you work. And be prepared in yourself to listen to what they tell you. And honestly, listening to feedback is a hard thing to do. Your natural reaction is to bristle and be defensive and want to push back and explain, well, actually, you saw it as this, but the reason I did that. 
that you know you have to take it on and internalize it and accept it for what it is and figure out how you can become better as a result of it it's such an important part of the nhs that we're open about it when we get it wrong and we do get it wrong we get it wrong every day somewhere in the interactions we have with people and we've got to listen learn acknowledge that and try to improve as a result you've got to do that yourself to become a better leader don't walk away from the difficult questions it's the things you don't tackle that will haunt you in the middle of the night and it's those problems about people's performance or the difficult circumstances they are the ones that, that you will look back on months later and think i wish i'd got to grips with that earlier that is a skill set and it takes courage to do it and i said there be courageous recognize when you're going to try and do something difficult and seek help with it I mean, go and ask people you trust. Ask your friends and family for their support to get into it. Challenge prejudice and cruelty. That's really important. There have been times in my life where I've heard someone make a remark that has been racist or homophobic and where I haven't said anything about it. Um, not in recent years, but when I was younger and when I was more junior. And I didn't have the courage to say that is not acceptable. And we must not tolerate that. You're only as good as a leader or as a person as the worst thing you walk past. And it's been wonderful this year that we've had such a focus on the incredibly unfair experience of a, of a lot of our black colleagues in the NHS and people from all BAME backgrounds. And we've seen, you know, COVID kills more people from BAME backgrounds, not because there's any genetic predisposition. It kills more black people because society discriminates against black people. They have fewer opportunities in work. They live in poor housing and are exposed more to the disease. And some of that is because for centuries and decades, you know, we have tolerated too much prejudice and cruelty. And it's the responsibility of people like me to speak out against that and to give courage to others that they should too. So leadership is an act, can be an act of courage. And by that, I don't mean sort of crazy over the top bravery, but it's being prepared not to tolerate stuff that we should not tolerate. But also to be kind to yourself in doing this, you know, talk to yourself the way you would to a friend when you think you've got something wrong. You know, um, don't beat yourself up for the things that you, you've got wrong all the time because that you can't carry that load. You know, don't take on weight for everyone's failings. Try and be the best at what you're responsible for and take care of your own mental and physical health. And um, throughout a lot of my career, I suffered with, with poor mental health. Um, from probably my late teenage years, I had um, a number of interactions through primary care and on a couple of occasions in hospital and um, because of mental ill health. And it wasn't until I was in my early 30s that I was actually diagnosed with, um, with a form of, of chronic uh, mental illness, a form of bipolar disorder called cyclothymia. And I finally got help and treatment for that. And I think if I hadn't had that help and treatment, there's no question in my mind I wouldn't be capable of doing this job or indeed functioning, I think, in, in half the way I can now. You need to look after your mental and physical health and leadership roles. Um, you know, I, I run. I find that running is a fantastic thing to do with stress. In the last five, ten years of my life, I've given up smoking, I've given up alcohol in the end because my relationship with it was unhealthy. And you have to recognise, actually, that you have to look after your mental and physical health to be the best person that you can be. Um, and I wish I'd learned that younger. And I regret some of the years in my 20s and 30s that I wasted because I didn't pay enough attention to being kind and thinking about myself and my impact on those around me. Um, so take care of your mental and physical health. And, you know, I'm not saying don't face up to challenges and do different difficult things, but do them thinking about yourself and your resilience in that. And I suppose, what do I wish I'd known when I was earlier in my career? There's a song by The Faces called Ooh La La with a chorus that goes, I wish I knew what I know now when I was younger. And, you know, I was terrible at listening to older people's advice when I was young. And I suppose now sitting here, you know, I don't know how old you all are because I can't see you, it's a bit weird, but you know, I imagine you to be um, you know, younger and fitter and healthier and less creaky than me and thinking, you know, is this old white geezer um, telling us what we should do? But I suppose this might be helpful. And you know, if nothing else, you might remember this in 20 years' time and think, oh, we had a point there. Um, but but th find out what you like doing and what you're good at first. You know, when I left university, I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do. Actually, I wanted to be in a band. Um, and I thought I might want to write a novel, even though I've never written anything novelistic and I think I'd be bad at it. You know, I didn't really have a clue. But what I did do was find out what I liked doing and what I was good at. And what I was good at doing was talking to people and listening to them and trying to find out how I could help them and where things weren't going well. And actually, you know, spend your 20s doing a bit of that and then find a job that aligns with that. And, you know, look maybe at your 30s. Is that period when you build your skill set, you learn to do the things you're interested in, the technical skills that make you get better at your job. 
so that by the time you get to where you want to be, and I am in my 40s despite appearances, um, you want to be where you want to be and you're able to sort of function at the sort of peak of your energy and your your skill set and you know you're you're still physically and mentally healthy enough that, that things are working for you, you know, and you can and you can try to really make something of yourself in your 40s and so on. Because actually, really, I think by the time you get into your 50s, you want to start to be in a position where you're bringing through people who can replace you and then building teams. And, you know, throughout my career, I've always tried to develop people and bring them through. But really, my aim is by the time I get into that next decade, I can really be looking at people around me and saying, who is going to be brilliant in the future? And um, to open the door also to those who have not had that opportunity to bring in more people from BAME backgrounds, you know, to increase the representation of black clinicians in, in, in the workforce of people from other ethnic backgrounds and create a more fair and equitable playing field for people from different gender, people with lived experience and mental health and open that door behind you and pull people through. You know, at Oxley's we're about to set up a shadow executive team, 12 people um, with in the first five years of their NHS careers who are going to get access to all the information and decision making that runs through our executive team at the same way that we do as a senior group. And I want those 12 people in that shadow exec to be some of our leaders of the future and to look far more like our workforce looks now and less like people like me. Um, don't be in a rush, you know, um, anyone who I meet who's 18 or 20 who knows exactly what they want to do with their life, they frighten me, people like that, you know. Most people I know in senior jobs don't have a plan. They followed good people, they followed advice, they took opportunities. Some people have inherent opportunities. I have opportunities because I'm white and because I'm a man. Um, and we have to recognize actually that part of it is about creating more opportunity for others. You know, I wouldn't have been offered some of the opportunities I did if I was a black man of the same age uh, as I am. It just wouldn't have happened. So in some of this fairness, we have to make sure that we, we in a planned way, bring people through and offer that. Um, some other advice, I think, you know, someone said this to me once, I don't know if it's absolutely true, but you'll make at least one big mistake in your career. I did. Um, I got kicked out of a job in the home office before I passed my probation. Um, someone, my previous boss had said, you'll hate it there. And they were right, I was wrong for the culture and I failed my probation. And at the age of 29, found myself out of a job and having to try to, to restart my career. And I made a big mistake there, but do try not to make that same mistake twice. Listen to people who know you and tell you what you're good at. Um, and sometimes follow their advice because they're not always right. And you've got to have the time and space to make your own mistakes and find what's right for you. But this is really important. The work you do and the way you treat people in your work reflects on you at a very deep level. So in my life, whether I've been um, assembling toilet ball valves in a factory for 12 hour shifts uh, or put, basting butter over tea cakes on a conveyor belt or working in a, a record shop or working on a newspaper or whatever, you know, try to do it to the best standard you can. Um, you know, there are, you know, there are no, there's no justification for looking at someone and what job they do and thinking less of them because of their job. That's a horrible way to approach the world. Um, and the way you treat people and value people and treat them with dignity and respect, it reflects on you. And if you're capable of looking at someone and their job and their status in the world and thinking less of them as a human being for that, that says nothing about them and says a lot about you. And actually to be a good leader, you know, you have to have that respect um, for, for people around you. Everyone is a human with the same hopes and loves and desires for them and for their family and the people they care about. And if you can't embrace that as a leader, you know, you have no right to be in that position really. The NHS is a great place to work. I love it. And um, I really, really would uh, recommend you have a think about it. And, you know, you might be thinking, well, I've not done the training to be a doctor or to be a nurse or a therapist or, you know, there's many roles outside clinical specialties. And one of the great things about the NHS is it works well when it brings those different things together. We have many jobs in business management, finance, operational management, which is how I got into it, actually. Um, workforce development, you know, data, you can see all the stuff I've got in there, but you know, we're a huge, huge, big organization. Oxley's is quite a small trust, but we've got, you know, just shy of 4,000 people working for us, probably 20% of them are clinical. Um, you know, my background was actually in com communications and coming through and that. So have a look on NHS jobs, have a look on trust websites and see what's out there. And um, we at Oxley's by the end of this year, will have offered 80 apprenticeships to people. And we're actually having a discussion at the minute about what it would look like if we made all our entry level jobs, apprenticeship jobs, and because, you know, what I would love to come out of this is I'd love someone on this lecture to come up to me in a few years time and say, I got into the NHS because of that. 
Um, one of the best conversations I had this year was with a, a, a woman who, when she was a sixth former in a school quite near here, saw a presentation from one of our physiotherapists. And she's now gone away, trained as a physiotherapist and is working for Oxley's because of that. And that makes me incredibly proud and incredibly hopeful for the future. So it's a great place to work. Um, you know, there's, there's hard bits of the NHS. You know, some places the culture isn't right. And, you know, some bits of Oxley's, we've got more to do to get that right. But it is a privilege to be able to say that you do a job that matters and that improves and changes people's lives. But yeah, just to leave you with something, I saw one of the questions there about what you take away from this. You know, there's no born leaders, despite what some people with certain backgrounds might think. Um, you know, one of my jobs, I worked in a place that was almost entirely people from public school backgrounds. And I was intimidated to bits by the way they spoke, by their skiing holidays and, you know, all the things they were familiar with that felt like a totally alien world to me. But after about three months, I realised I was better at most of what I did than they were. Actually, you know, and I realised that their incredible self-confidence was was often misplaced. You know, some brilliant people in there as well. But so don't don't write people off at all because of their background, because that's doing what I said you shouldn't. But don't do yourself down, and you can learn to do this stuff. I mean, you know, learn about yourself, how others see you, identify your negative behaviours, and embrace them, and decide what kind of leader you want to be, and how you would like other people to describe you, and try and live up to that. And, I've tried to frame all this as positives, but what I'll say now is a couple of don'ts. I and mean, I try not to use language like this, but don't give people reason to distrust you. Um, trust is the single most important thing in work and personal relationships. It's very hard to repair when you break it. And I've done things in my life where I've lost people's trust because of the way I've behaved. And they are the things I feel worst about. Um, you know, so try not to give people reason to distrust you. Don't be a cynic. Don't be that miserable person. This won't work because of X, Y, and Z. There's a really interesting study. One of our very brilliant psychiatrists, Dr. Derek Tracy, sent to me a while ago. Interestingly, people think cynics are, are more intelligent than people who are optimistic at, at first impressions. There's something about that kind of slightly cool cynic that appeals, but you know, it's very thin when you poke at it. Don't be a cynic. In those circumstances if you find yourself as a leader and in any context where you're in a leadership role and you hear your voice becoming cynical you need to stop that and if you can't stop it you need to leave because you undermine everyone you're leading in that point don't ignore racism and don't ignore other forms of prejudice and don't walk past them actually because that will eat away at you when you remember what you walked past and don't shame others or treat them without respect because you know there's few evil people in the world, I think, but actually one of the real evils we're living with just now is, is that sense of prejudice and that shame and that sort of horrible social media whirlwind where everyone is getting constantly beaten up and polarised. What a hugely unhealthy place that is for us all to spend any of our time. And seek value in others and see the value in yourself. Um, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say you can all be NHS trust chief execs. That's a ridiculous thing to say, you know. But what I can say is, you know, if I can do this kind of thing, you know, if I can put in the effort and work to get here, you know, we all can. We all have huge potential. Um, you know, you can learn these things. You can learn it as a practice. You know, don't be intimidated and seize those opportunities. But as I say, do you know what? A lot of you on here, you're young. Don't rush. Don't beat yourself up. Take your time and find the stuff you love. And if you can find a job where what you do is what you love, your life will be so much the better for it. Thank you. Matthew, thank you so much for taking us through that. I really, really appreciate it. It's such an interesting career that you've had uh, as well. And thank you to everyone for sending in your questions. They're coming through as we speak. And just a reminder that if you do have a question, or if you can't perhaps think of one, but you do see one up there that you like the look of, then uh, it's not like you've got the hang of it already. Make sure you hit the upvote button and uh, those questions will rise right to the top of the list. So make sure you let us know if you do have any questions. Uh, just before we move on to those questions, though, I had a couple from me, if I may. Uh, it really interests me as to uh, who inspires certain people to get into their careers. Um, you know, you see Prime Minister, for example, he always says it's uh, Winston Churchill. Um, who is it that inspired you to follow the career pathway that, that you did? That's interesting. And the, certainly from a professional context, there's a couple of people I work with. Um, there's a chap, David Bean, who was chief executive of the Care Quality Commission when I was there. He's now doing a lot of health education in England. And he was a leader um, who talked a huge amount about integrity and authenticity. And I found David a really inspiring guy to work for. Um, and also Simon Gillespie, who I worked for at the Multiple Sclerosis Society. Um, who um, is now been through the British Heart Foundation and other people, but that was people who I worked to 
who really inspire me. But lots of it's been the people that have been around me um, and, and who I draw a lot of energy from. I mean, my, the deputy chief exec at, at Oxley's is a, a Dr. Ifia Kocha, who's a brilliant, wonderful psychiatrist and a great guy to work for and alongside, and who ran Oxley as well. It was seconded, actually. And his insight and look on the world is, is a, a great thing. So I'm not really in the sort of Churchillian space. I'm more in people who I've worked with, who I've saw do things and thought that made me feel better and happier about the way I am. Um, and that's been really important to me. And I would also say the influence of your family and friends. You know, the way my parents brought me up was important. The way that I talked to my, my wife and, and my kids and, and things like that. So I suppose I wouldn't say there's any one great big national figure who's always inspired me. Um, but there are many who personally have touched me. And I should also say, I've learned a lot from people who I've worked alongside or for and thought, I hope I never do that. Um, and there is something about seeing negative behaviours in others and, and trying to pick that up and, and make sure that you don't do that. And I'm lucky at Oxley's also to have a brilliant chairman, um, Andy Trotter, who used to be Chief Constable of British Transport Police and has a fantastic career. But I'm conscious I'm reeling off a list of, of, uh, of white men by and large, with the exception of Ify. And I think you know one of the problems with the NHS, we need to be more diverse in our icons and those who inspire us. And this year, actually, people like Marcus Rashford, and some of those um, really brilliant examples we've seen brought forward by people like that have, have really brought the world to life in a different way for me. 100%, 100%. Um, right, let's move on to uh, some of the questions that have been coming through. Uh, Stuart Blackmore has sent in uh, both a comment and a question. I'm going to read the entire thing up because I think it's important that you hear it. Uh, Stuart has said, absolutely amazing personal account of how you've risen to your current position and just how wonderful the NHS are. You all have been both responsive and adaptive to the current crisis. At, at London South East Colleges, we have seen a big increase in adults wanting to be care workers, particularly in health and in social work. So what advice would you give to those learners venturing into a new health related career to help them with their resolve to join the fight to make a difference? Thank you, and thanks, Stuart, for those. That's lovely to hear that. Um, and, you know, it's great to hear, actually, that within the colleges as well, you've got this interest in the NHS. I mean, as a sector, we're a massive employer, and actually, we do carry quite high vacancy rates. I mean, at Oxley's, our vacancy rate's pretty low. But if you look across South East London and across London as a whole, there are literally tens of thousands of vacancies in the NHS. Um, you know, in particular specialties, you know, trying to bring people through is, is, a, is a big priority for us, both in health and social work. And I think it's important we don't forget that link with social work. I think there's lots of great places you can go to to find advice about your chosen career path. And um, I think, you know, have a look on what's available through NHS jobs. But also, if you're interested in a specific kind of profession, physiotherapy, podiatry, you know, working in prisons or forensic psychiatry or psychology or whatever, you know, have a think about those kind of, of there's good websites to tell you what you need to do in terms of qualifications and in terms of your career pathway. What you'll probably find is by certain points in your life, some aspects might be closed off to you. You know, with the best will in the world, if you're 21 and suddenly decide a career in medicine is the one for you, you might find out you're five or six years late in that decision, but that doesn't mean there's not loads of other opportunities to get into a allied um, clinical profession. So be prepared to be flexible because if what you want to do is care for people and support them, there's a lot of different ways in. And um, look at things like apprenticeships and other options as well. And also look at what your local trusts are making available. Um, and maybe when we send this out, we can give some information on some of the apprenticeship options that we're creating at Oxley's as well. Um, but what I would say is the important thing is if you've got that connection on a personal level, the thing to do is get in and try just to find a job that gets your foot in the door. Once you're in the NHS, it's easier to move around within it and to access the support that's available there. And don't be disheartened if it takes a while to get in. Try to find something else you can do that builds up those, that support for you. And then there are some professions at the minute, you know, psychology, for example, where there is very high competition for some places as well. And there's something about thinking about um, careers as a bit of a tree. And sometimes it's worth venturing out onto a branch to have a look from a slightly different perspective before coming back. I've done one or two sideways moves in my career because I've looked at what I've done and I've realized I've got holes in my CV and my skill set. You know, so don't be too fixated that if I don't do this, it's going to be a disaster. Sometimes you might need to do something slightly sideways to get you into the right place. But um, yeah, I'm really pleased to hear that, Stuart, and I wish all the best to, to you and your, your colleagues at LSE who want to pursue the NHS as a place to work. Uh, Guest 78 has asked, uh, what would you say to someone who is keen on pursuing a career in the NHS at the current time, both young people currently at school and college, but also older people who may be looking to reskill or upskill. Uh, I think that kind of ties in with a question that I, I wanted to ask as well. What's probably 
the uh, one best piece of advice that you have ever received? I think those two questions kind of go hand in hand. Oh, I mean, that's difficult, isn't it? I suppose I try to capture some of that um, that, that advice um, in, in there in terms of being kind to yourself and, and treating others with dignity and respect. And I suppose that that's not a very NHS specific example, is it? I, I, so I, th I think there's something about looking at what's available to you and being realistic about where you can get in. Um, you know, people who want to reskill and come back, there is increasingly good information available through the people plan, the NHS people plan, and some of the national resources available out but there about, about different resources. I mean, one of the things that really struck me at the Nightingale was talk to someone who worked in a brewery um, who was now working as a porter in the intensive care ward. Um, you know, talking to someone else who, who was a hairdresser um, who was now in there providing direct personal care to people who were, were unconscious and intubated. And I think to look around and be prepared to be flexible about the opportunities he sees. But as I said, NHS jobs, local trust websites, national people plan. And the, the odds are most people know someone who works somewhere in the NHS. Have a talk to them, find out how you've gotten through them. And I'm sure within the colleges, you've got some great sources of, of uh, inspiration and advice for this too. Charles Yates has asked, if you had a magic wand and had to do something similar to setting up a Nightingale Hospital again, what would you change? What would I change? Oh, I mean, that, that was the Nightingale thing. So the, one of the most difficult bits of it that we kind of picked up earlier on was the internal communications. Um, because what we had was staff who worked all across London and outside London, and some didn't even work for the NHS, who kind of come together and said we wanted to help. But because of the way the shift patterns work and the structure of the place, you realise that actually within most organisations, you've got this gift of knowing how to get messages out to people and how to tell people what's happening and how to keep them updated on what's going on. And at the Nightingale, because we didn't have that, social media became a kind of default communication channel. And that was very difficult, actually, for people because the pace, the, the ability of rumours to spiral out of control, some bad actors on there and some of the inaccuracies, you know, that was really difficult, created a huge amount of stress and tension that was difficult for, for a lot of the staff. So I'd probably approach the internal comms thing in a much more rigorous way from the start. The other is the unintended consequences of acting very quickly. So when we were asking for volunteers to help, um, a form was created asking people to register and it said, you know, what's your name? It said, uh, what's your clinical background, your clinical skill set? And it was a free text box and you wouldn't believe how many different ways people can describe their job that mean the same thing. And so you had people say, I'm a critical care nurse, crit care nurse, C care nurse, intensive care nurse, ITU nurse, ICU nurse. And suddenly we had all this data where it was really hard to pick out people with the right specialties because we'd allowed free text. And there was a, a you know, what's your contact details box? Some people have mobile phone number separated, solid mobile phone number, personal email. You know, and what you realized was that because of the pace we were working at, some of the unintended consequences of quick decisions were felt for the whole period the hospital was open. So magic wand wise, um, a bit more time to plan would be lovely, but it's not always possible. Um, I, I don't know, the gift of hindsight is a wonderful thing actually. I don't think we made many bad decisions in that I think you could make a decision, a range of decisions with the information you have. I think a decision can become bad when you stick to it while you realize it was wrong. You know, if you get new information and realize you should have changed tack, a reasonable decision can come, become a bad decision. And I suppose it's trying to make hindsight a live way of changing things as you go. But um, magic wand wise, yeah, yeah, that's a good good question. Good point to chew on. Uh, we've got time for just one final question. Guest 894 has asked, what's the biggest thing that you've taken from this whole experience during the pandemic? I'm assuming that's what they're talking about. It's been a pretty horrible year, really, hasn't it? I think. Um, I suppose one of my lasting impressions of COVID, you know, at one level there's the horrible individual tragedy of what it's done to people who've been directly affected by it. But I think the effect it's had on all of us, it's made most aspects of life a bit like um, flying with a budget airline. Um, you know, in that almost everything you do now is a bit more rubbish than it used to be. You know, there's more waiting, there's less spontaneity, lots of the stuff that just brings sort of love and a sense of wonder into the world has been dampened down this year. Um, and actually, I think what we need to do is find ways where we adapt and we take more time out to recognise the stuff that's good in the world and make more time and breathing space for that, the people we care about, the things we enjoy doing with each other. Get out in the fresh air, put your phone off, you know, delete Twitter, um, you know, get rid of Facebook for goodness sake and, and, you know, focus on the things that make life worth living because 
you're not going to sit there at the end of your life and look back and think, you know, I wish I'd done, you know, more social media or, you know, I wish I'd spent more hours at work and less time with my family. You know, it's trying to find that golden thread that connect the things that you love and the things that you do. And if you can find that sweet spot, I think a lot of us need to find that sweet spot again as we come through this winter. Because, you know, for all it's been a hard year, actually, I think the winter that's coming for some of us in the NHS might be even tougher. And we've got to look after our staff and our people as we go through that. And for those of you who've got NHS people in your families, thank you for all the love and support you can bring them. 100%. Matthew, thank you ever so much for taking us through that landmark lecture with us. It's been a pleasure having you here. I'm going to hand back over to Sam now for some final words. Sam? Thanks very much, Joe, and thank you so much, Matthew, for such an inspiring and interesting presentation. It was so honest and your integrity shone through, uh, sharing your personal values and your personal insight and your valuable advice to our students um, about following careers uh, in the NHS. Uh, we really appreciate you spending this time with us today because we know how incredibly busy you are um, at the moment. And one of the things that I really reflected on uh, in terms of your, your experience and career journey really is about the difference for all of us between who you are and who you want to be is often the things that you do, how you behave, how you conduct yourself and your personal values. And I think that's such an important lesson uh, for all of us. And I think, um, you know, reflecting on your comments about the NHS heroes labels, uh, for all of us, uh, we know that, um, you know, to be heroic means so many different things. But it, for me, means about being courageous and having the um, confidence to go ahead and conquer your fears. And you've been one of those people throughout this pandemic who's truly acted in a heroic way. Uh, you've been part of creating history at a time when so many of us have um, only been able to contribute in so many more peripheral ways. And you are really, truly an inspiration to us. But also we can see from the things you said to us about how inspiring Oxleys is as an organisation. You're clearly a learning organisation. Uh, our students who are business students do a lot of thinking about what is a learning organisation. And uh, we understand that to be a group of people who are continually expanding and are engaging their capabilities to really create and accelerate future possibilities. And so I think as an organisation, uh, we've learned a lot about Oxleys today as well. And just to finish, really, I think it was Benjamin Franklin who said that um, if you tell me things, I forget. If you teach me, I often remember. But if you involve me, I learn. And I think your the way in which you've involved us in your thinking and your career journey and also the lessons that you've learned uh, about leadership and management along the way, and in particularly over the last few months, have been absolute um, lessons for us to learn from and to replicate. And I'm sure we'll be talking about those lessons, uh, both in the classroom and in our management team meetings moving forward. So thank you very much uh, once again uh, from all of us. You've inspired many of us today uh, to pursue careers in the NHS and particularly this is so poignant at a time where we're also very grateful for all the work being done to care for people affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we wish you all the very best for the coming months. We know that's going to be continue to be challenging for our healthcare workers and for the NHS. And we want to thank you once again for your inspiring talk. Thank you.